My name is Jane Collins, and on behalf of Leeds Civic Trust, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our latest virtual event. Tonight, we're heading a few miles out of Leeds City Centre to the suburb of Kirkstall, where on the banks of the River Air, we will find the ruins of Grade 1 listed Kirkstall Abbey. Our guide for the evening is Jane Abrison. Jane has worked as a volunteer guide at Kirkstall Abbey since about 2018. During this time, she, sh she has shown the Abbey to visitors of all ages and from all over the world. Maybe some people who are watching this video now did one of her to us. Um, and Jane admits to being fascinated by the Abbey and has enthusiastically researched both the building and its monks. If you do have any questions or comments, please use the chat function, which you will, well, I think you all know where it is now because you're chatting a lot. Um, we will pick up these questions and comments at the end of the tour, which should last about 45 minutes. I'm now going to hand over to Jane and she's going to give us a guide's perspective of the Abbey and an insight into the lives of the monks who lived there. So, over to you, Jane. Right. Okay, um, just one sec. Oh, I don't have that rid of that bit. Okay, can everybody see this now? I think that should be okay. Um, right, um, I'm Jane Abramson. Um, I've been asked to do this talk from the point of view of a guide. Um, and therefore I'm wearing my guiding uniform. I thought I'd get into character before I started. Um, I've been, I've met people from all over the world while I've been doing my tours. Um, and certainly a lot of people have come in tonight from the States and from all over, which is brilliant. Iceland, Thailand, everywhere. Um, actually some of the most interesting people that I've taken around the Abbey um, have been local, living even in Kirkstall, people who've passed the Abbey very many times but have never stopped to have a look round and um, they are fascinated and I say to them at the end, well you can take your visitors round next time they come and you'll know all about it. Um, so I'm going to start here by doing a little bit of a talk about the history of um, the uh, Abbey because I think that's the most important bit to set the scene. Now you've probably noticed that it's a Cistercian Abbey and um, it was founded, it, the Cistercian movement was founded in Cito in France in 1098 by a group of monks who felt that the Benedictines weren't adhering strictly enough um, to the um, Benedictine rules and they wanted to set up somewhere very remote by themselves and have a peaceful life um, that was very quiet. Um, so first group set out and one of the famous abbeys near here is Fountains Abbey and that was founded in 1132. Um, but our story of Kirkstall Abbey, which is a daughter abbey to um, Fountains, begins in 1147. Um, and this was Henry de Lacy, who was a powerful Norman baron with extensive Norman lands. Um, and he promised to dedicate an abbey to the Virgin Mary um, after he survived, if he survived a serious illness. Well, he did survive. So he went off um, to fountains um, and he was followed by 12 Cistercian monks and they went off to Benoldswick, which is on the border between Lancashire and Yorkshire, um, part of the lands that he had. They stayed there for about six years, but they upset the locals, particularly by destroying the church to flatten it, ready to set up their new abbey. Um, and therefore um, they decided this wouldn't work. So Abbot Alexander, who was the first abbot, um, he set off 
to try and prospect to find a really quiet valley that was very remote from everything else. And he came across this wooded valley of the River Eyre um, and um, he thought this is an ideal location. It had the river for water and for transport. It had um, wood and gritstone from Bramley Falls, which locals will know is just up, up river from Kirkstall, but others of you won't know that yet. So there were a few hermits in the grounds, but they decided that um, they could join as lay brothers or they'd just be paid to leave. So they put up some rough wooden buildings to sleep and pray during building, and they built the church first of all. Now I've got a model here just to show you what this was like. Um, I'm having a bit of a problem here. Here we are. Uh, uh, right, can you see the next slide? Sorry about this. Um, got a slight glitch at the top of my computer screen, but never mind. Um, now, the University of Lee of Sheffield did a survey about 20 years ago and they produced some computer generated models of what parts of the Abbey might have looked like in the early days. Um, and this is what the church itself would have looked like, um, very plain most of the, the way through. So um, that gives you a little bit of an idea of what it was like. Um, at the same time as this was expanded, um, the um, uh, wool trade took off because they had granges that were owned by, um, first of all, the family and then gradually by Kirkstall Abbey. So the, the, a lot of farming went on, um, producing all sorts, but particularly wool. And this is important for Leeds um, because um, they um, crossbred sheep. They had beautiful wool that was in great demand. And gradually the Abbey became much more wealthy um, and very active in the wool trade. And so it was the early, I would argue, the early starting point for the Industrial Revolution in Leeds, which led on to the cloth trade later on, of course. Um, so um, I'm setting the scene now for our tour um, and thinking about these monks and the Cistercian abbeys had this very harsh regime. Um, it was silent, but not Trappist. Um, there was no heating apart from brief visits to a warming room in the winter. Um, now I'm going to start our tour a little bit further out than I usually do because we don't have to walk. We're on a virtual tour here. So we're starting at the outer gatehouse, um, the Vesper Gate. Um, and um, this is um, behind the very appropriately named Vesper Gate pub. And it's all of that's left of the gateway to the outer precinct. And the precinct was about 40 acres in total. And if we walked through that in the old days, um, we would have seen many small buildings, farming, industry, water meadows, pasture, orchards, mills, etc. Um, for the craftsmen. And um, the mill pond was where the car park is now opposite the abbey. Now we're going to move in. I'm just going to try something here, first of all. That's better. Um, I've got a problem here at the moment. Well, I'll carry on talking while I try and sort this out for you, um, but we're going to come into the inner gatehouse in a minute, um, which is where um, the cafe is. And some of you might know the cafe at um, the uh, house, um, Abbey House, and that's where the inner gate was. And there was um, a monk was in charge there and he um, would ask people where they'd come from and decide whether they were allowed in or not or whether um, they were allowed to um, stay. 
Um, so here we are, here's the inner gatehouse, and that's the cafe as well, which people will recognise. So we're coming through here, we're assuming that we're allowed into the grounds, and we're coming down the path, um, and the crocuses are out like they are today, and we're passing, um, you can't see it very well there because there's so little left of it, um, but the guest house. Um, now, monks had very much um, a... Uh, way of welcoming people, welcoming strangers. The guest house really didn't appear until the 1300s, um, but a lot of people stayed there who were perhaps going between Benoldswick and Pontefract, part of um, the uh, way through for the de Lacy's. But we're coming down now into the main part of the abbey itself. Some of you who know this will recognise where we're going down to is the um, entrance to the shop um, and the visitor centre there. Um, so um, we're first of all looking at this. Um, we're at the west end of the abbey um, and this is where the lay brothers lived. There were two types of monks. There were lay brothers who did all the work. They came from labouring class backgrounds. Um, they were not educated and they did all the hard work for the abbey and they lived completely separately from the choir monks who studied, read, prayed um, and were part of the main, the main reason for the abbey there. Um, now what we can see ahead of us here is it's not the nicest place to start but it's called the Reredorta which is actually a sort of latrine block and this was for the lay brothers but it was actually very civilised and this poor chap here has been sitting here for years just to demonstrate what it's like and there were um, wooden partitions um, between the seats and it was all very civilised and walls going down to drains that flushed out um, from the mill pond at the top down into the river. So that all worked very well. Um, and if we come round the corner from there, um, you can see the top on the top floor there, um, this is where they went in from the dormitory where they slept at night into the Rera Daughter at the top. The space underneath was probably um, for a storage facilities and that kind of thing. But while we're here, you can just see that there were buttresses, um, but they were put up at a much later stage when the abbey was kind of restored um, to make sure that none more of the walls fell down. Um, so we're moving now into what's called the solarium and at the end nearest us is where the refectory was for the lay brothers. So they ate completely separately. <laughs> they had a diet that was very much vegetarian. They had pottage and that kind of thing. They had to keep silent. They didn't talk to each other. So there they were on benches in the refectory. At some point, when I take children round here with their parents, their parents think, well, can you imagine if you were sat there in silence for a meal? And they um, think that's quite amusing. Um, you can see sort of at the, at the edge of the um, wall, the base of arches, which went all the way over the top. So there would have been arched, um, arched roof over the top um, and that went to the dormitory above. Um, and if we at the far end there, you can see where the solarium, that the cellarer he was called, he had a very busy job. Um, he ordered from merchants and he received visitors to the abbey. So he had to keep records of all the livestock on the granges and in the fish ponds. He was responsible for ensuring a regular supply of food. There were a lot of people there by now, at least 75 lay brothers and probably that many choir monks in the early days. Um, there were feasts where they needed special food and fasts were observed um, and he had to make sure all the usual things like cooking and eating utensils were provided and ensure there was enough wood to keep the fires going for the cooking. So considerable feat. Now this solarium lasted quite a long time, but um, it felt the roof fell in in 1825. Um, it collapsed under heavy snow, and presumably the outer wall there, where the um, railings are. Um, so although you can get an idea of the shape of it, um, it's not. Um, obviously fully restored yet. Um, if we come back a little bit, you can see an entrance there um, into the kitchen. Um, obviously the kitchen was going to be next to the refectory, so that's the next bit we're going to go into with this virtual tour. We're going to just have a little look at that. 
Before we do that, I'm just going to show you, I don't know if it helps at all, a little model here. We came in at the end where um, that there's the Rera daughter and we're, we're down here where there was a roof, obviously, on the refectory and the dormitory. And then it goes through to the church and we'll be gradually moving round the site through the church, out the other side to the um, east end of the cloister and then we'll be looking at some of the buildings beyond that so that that just i put that in just to give you a quick idea of what it's like so let's have a look at the lay brothers kitchen here to begin with it was fairly small and near to the left of just where i'm standing there there was a big hearth and they did find some cooking utensils when the, one of the archaeological digs was done there but there's been lots of changes over the centuries you can see windows that are filled in arches filled in i think at the back where that black section is behind that trough i think that probably was a bread oven if we look at it the other way um, we see um, the bigger area that was extended. There's some little play things here to encourage children to come and play kitchens in here if they want to. And beyond that far wall was the choir monks refectory. So the kitchen served both um, types to begin with. Now, I think you find this bit quite interesting. You can just about make out in the foreground a circular trough. And that was a vat. Um, and that was used for brewing malt. Now, the local river water wasn't really fit to drink, so um, they had ale instead, um, and that was made with malt, not hops. So it was a bit less alcoholic. They added things like bog myrtle, ivy and yarrow, um, and they did find drinking vessels um, nearby. Um, later, apparently, it was discovered ale didn't keep as well as beer brewed from hops, so they swapped over. Just one other little thing on the right hand side of this picture you can see a drain going through and this is the one that came from the Rera daughter and it goes through past the kitchens past the abbot's lodging which we'll see in a little bit and um, out down to the river so it was all very civilized really at that time so now we move on um, we're going to go back through the solarium into the cloister and this is kind of a wow moment for visitors because it's one of the best preserved cloisters certainly in the north of england in old abbeys um, and you can see all the way round so we're going to look first of all at the south side of the abbey church which i mentioned was dedicated to the virgin mary these rounded arches are norman arches or called romanesque arches um, and then I get visitors to have a look and see these squares in the wall and wonder what they are. And they're actually where roof supports were put in for the roof of the cloister, which then rested on pillars that went down to the ground. So it was a covered way all the way round, like you do see on other cloisters. Um, and what's quite interesting as well, it was pointed out to me later, some of the very little marks further up the wall, rather than the big squares, were, were where um, there had been scaffolding, wooden scaffolding during the building works, because it would have all been covered over before that. Another interesting feature of this wall, you can see clearly that rubble in the wall there. Now, we're still at the Lay Brothers side of the Abbey, and that was the Lay Brothers wall, um, which went all the way across to keep them completely separate. So they couldn't see the choir monks, they couldn't disturb them, they could move in and out from Lay Brothers Lane, which was between that wall and the wall of the solarium. And then, as we'll see in a moment, they could move silently into the church. So it was extraordinary the way that they were kept so um, separate from each other. You can actually see that on the other end of the wall, um, at the other end of the uh, cloister wall there. Um, so we're now going to go through the Lay Brothers church entrance into the west end of the church, which is basically the back of the church. And it was quite a sight for them to see. Uh, already you can see some of the pillars here before we turn the corner and see the nave in full. Just before we do that, because this is virtual and we don't have to go outside again, I just want to show you the outside of the north door because it is a very fine Norman door here. Um, and it was only used on special occasions for processions on festival days and that kind of thing. But it is a fascinating feature. 
It is very impressive when you get into the church. This is the South Isle, which has been beautifully preserved. You can really imagine what it's like. Um, and the North Isle um, it looks very much the same as that. Um, then we can see the real impact of the nave here, going down to what you see there as a huge Gothic window. Now that Gothic window was put in in the late 1400s. Um, in a moment I'll show you um, what, it, what it would have been like before that. Um, and um, you can see the pillars there. I often get visitors to have a look and see at the different designs of pillars and at the top of them as well. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we want children to look for in a minute. But if you notice that there are square blocks at the bottom there. So um, this um, is the, you can see more clearly now, this beautiful Gothic window and you can see these capitals. So um, when it was all built, um, one of the questions I used to ask was, how did the Lay Brothers know how to build a um, Cistercian Abbey? Because they're all very similar, but I think they had traveling um, stone masons, engineers, civil engineers, they must have done to level it all um, and use the Lay Brothers for the labor. So another picture here, which is a computer generated picture again from the University of Sheffield, showing what it might have looked like. There was a rose window originally and fascinatingly, apparently in Leeds Museum store, there are little pieces from that um, rose window there, which are interesting to see. The whole thing was lime washed and painted white. Um, and um, so it wasn't the way we look at it now in stone. Um, and often what they did was they painted in symmetrical red mortar lines, not the mortar lines as they actually are, but symmetrical ones. Um, so very plain. Um, and then if we look at the other end, that's the um, west door um, looking outwards there, very, very plain. And it was so plain, all the windows were plain glass. There were no ornaments. They had a rough um, altar with iron candlesticks. Um, and um, so it was very plain, very much in the Cistercian line of having everything very simple. If we come back to looking at the nave again, you can see a line going across near where that light, that um, sunlight is. And that marks the place where the rood screen was, um, which separated off the lay brothers from the choir monks. Um, and they had their services at the west end of the um, church. And they would have a senior monk who would come and there was a little altar there and a senior monk would come and conduct um, the um, services that they had there. If you walk down towards the Gothic arch there, um, I often ask children, what can you see there? Well, why is that different? And they say, well, yeah, actually, those are bigger windows there, aren't they? Um, and um, they are there um, because it's called the retro choir. And they, they put the infirm old monks there who maybe their eyesight was fading a bit. Um, and um, they, uh, they could see better by having bigger windows. So those were put in a little bit later to make it a little bit more comfortable. Um, now, I just want to tell you a little bit about the tower because the top of the tower of Kirkstall Abbey is very iconic and I'm glad some of it survived. There's a pillar there now um, holding it all up. But as you saw in that original model from University of Sheffield, there wasn't a big tower to begin with. But in the later years, by the 1400s, the Abbey was getting more affluent, more wealthy. And the abbot of the time, Abbot William Marshall, wanted there to be a belfry on the top. So he thought we, they should have a big bell in a belfry. Now, I'll just take you outside for a minute to see this because you can see that familiar tower there. And only the top bit was the belfry. There were two little windows down below and um, the uh, belfry was there and it survived the, um, amazingly, it survived the dissolution, but it was just in 1779, there was a tremendous storm and it came crashing down. And that's the only bit that's left of it, but I'm glad it's there and I'm glad it's supported now because it really is iconic for Kirkstall Abbey. Now I'm going to go back to the presbytery here, um, which is, and you can see the, uh, 
the Gothic window just at the side there. The middle large bit there is called the sedilia, and that had a bench at the bottom, and that was where the abbot would sit and any visiting abbots during a service of mass. And I'm told that it had a canopy over the top. Um, the nearer to the Gothic window is the piscina, which had running water, and that was to um, wash the um, vessels, the chalice and the pattern ready for services. And the ormbury at this end nearest to us is where they stored wine that had been specially blessed for um, the mass. If we now look um, at the north transept, we can see three chapels here and each of them actually has a piscina in it. Now at this particular time with these wealthy men paid the abbey um, to build chapels and there are three in the south side as well, um, the, the south um, transept, um, and um, they were so that they would pay for their souls in purgatory so they would go to heaven. So they made sure everything was all right there. And then just around the corner from that in the north transept, um, you can see a doorway there that's been filled in. And this is called the funeral gate or the Porte de Mort. And when monks died, they were brought into the abbey for a simple funeral service, just wrapped in cloth. They went out through the funeral gate and were buried in unmarked graves. There's probably still a lot of them out there, actually, but we uh, obviously don't really know. Um, just put this one in three chapels in the south transept as well. One of them tiled. So I get visitors to have a look at that and try and visualize. Um, what it was all like. The main church to begin with had an earth floor and then later it was tiled. I'm told there are a lot of Kurtz Labby tiles in the um, Leeds Museum store. I'd love to see some of those and I think it'd be a nice project to try and put some of them back together. Just down from here in the south transept, we get to the night stairs and this is um, the next bit in um, the uh, talking about what the monks got up to. Now the monks were required to pray seven times a day and the first service was at 1 a.m. So they had night stairs so they could come from their dormitory, which is just through that arch there, down the steps um, into the church. There's a lovely little storyboard in the, the abbey here, which gives you a sort of um, picture of what they must, uh, must have looked like. I'm told that, uh, I mean, can you imagine a Yorkshire winter coming down there at 1 a.m. for the first service, going back to bed for a little while and being woken again. Um, but the chap at the front with the um, lantern to lead the way, and of course it would have all been very dark as well, um, was in charge of prodding them if they went to sleep. Um, so, um, the, uh, and again, we've got a little picture here from University of Sheffield showing what it would have looked like at one time with the steps going down um, and the sacristy, that little door there where they um, kept the, set of the vestments and sacred vessels. Right. Now, the next thing to tell you about is, uh, which is a story that some people locally have heard and others haven't, and that's that at one time after the dissolution um, and Kirk's Labby, well, it didn't fall into complete ruins, but obviously ruins compared with what it had been. And the main part of the church was used as a road from Leeds through to the Dales to Skipton and places. Now, I've got an engraving here. Um, which shows you um, the that big window, that Gothic window, it, all the stonework at the bottom had been taken out so that um, people could go through there with their wagons. And then this is the picture at the other end coming out of the west door. Um, now I mentioned to you as we were looking at the pillars, the stone plinths, those big square stone plinths, um, and I get children to have a look and see if they can see there's supposed to be scrape marks along the bottom where um, the hub from the um, some of the wagons, they might have been passing each other a bit close. But it does seem incredible, doesn't it? But there was a time when they, these old ruins were just not valued at all. And in fact, we, you can certainly see from the guest house and we'll see in a minute from the infirmary, people just helped themselves to stone and took it away to build themselves cottages and things like that. Some of it was legitimately um, purchased, but some of it wasn't. Um, 
alongside all these vehicles going through, some of the locals started graffitiing. And um, here's one which is a bit difficult to make out, but we reckon that that says 1756 on it. And then this one's quite amusing because I don't know whether it's genuine or not. L Oates, for those of you in Leeds will know Lawrence Oates, the polar explorer. Was it really him that carved that or was it somebody else? We will never know. But there are quite a lot of um, graffiti to be seen. It is quite interesting to see, actually. Right, we're coming out again at the cloister now at the top. You can see down to the um, back where the uh, lay brothers went into the church but we're out in the cloister again so this is the the next interesting bit to note um fortunately the day we went it was to take the photos it was nice and sunny and that's the south side of the wall so this was an obvious place with a lot of light bearing in mind artificial light wasn't great in those days for what we call the scriptorium and this is where the monks would sit outside the choir monks doing their beautiful scripts and their illustrations and everything else when there was plenty of light of course we must remember that there was a roof over the top of them um, and the cloister there um, so this uh, and I found this picture just to show you I mean obviously this isn't Kirkson but just to show you what it would have been like they're sitting there sideways on with the sun shining onto um, their manuscripts and what they were doing there um, so that that was quite um, a useful place to be um, next to that, we're now looking at the east side of the um, cloister. Um, the first bit there, that arch, which is blocked in now, that was a cupboard. And that's where the monks kept their quill pens, their ink, paper and vellum um, and where they did their manuscripts. Um, now, the next um, little bit is, is described as the library. But I've always been a bit sceptical about it, and so have my fellow guides. And I did find out from a fellow guide that that actually at the back is a fireplace. And at a later time when the Abbey was owned by a family, that was a um, place where children played. Um, so I think it was probably where they put their manuscripts they were working on at the time. Now, another real jewel in the crown of Kirkstall Abbey is the chapter house. And you can see those lovely rounded Norman or Romanesque arches going into the chapter house there. Um, and there's another picture here showing it. Um, and the chapter house was so called because every morning the um, choir monks gathered in the chapter house to hear the abbot or a senior cleric reading a chapter from the rules of St Benedict. After that, um, any of the monks that had any confessions, they felt that any sins, they prostrated themselves out in front of all the other monks to confess their sins and the punishments were then handed out. Might have been fasting, a beating, if it was really bad it would be expulsion. I don't think that happened very much. Um, again I've put a little mock-up picture here because the same idea, it was white with the um, marks in it, the um, so you can you get a better idea there of um, what that would have looked like. Um, not exactly like Kirkstall, but it just gives you a little idea. Now, our chapter house um, was extended and you can see the difference there. I get visitors to have a look and look at the difference between the rounded arches in the front of the um, chapter house and the Gothic arches as they move back. Now, also placed in the chapter house, although these aren't originally from Kirkstall, were three monks' tombs, stone tombs. And we wondered what they were put there for, but they're, I'm given to understand, they were, well, in fact, you can see they were put as ballast when they were building up the extension to the chapter house. Um, and I always reckon that I have, it's a bit, a bit difficult to see here, but I always reckon that there's one at the front there and you can see a rounded head. But um, a more amusing bit here, you can see two um, where those it's been cut away and there are some on the other side. And somebody asked me on one of the very early tours I did, um, what is that? And we were exploring and wondering what it was. And then I went to see Steve in the visitor centre, who is a mine of information. And he told me the story that um, 
they probably that the rumor went round that there was treasure inside those so people hacked away at the wall got their hand in to try and see whether there was some treasure that they could pull out um Perhaps on a more serious note, in some abbeys, abbots um, were buried under the floor of the, ch of the chapter house or in the wall. So or equally, that might not have been very pleasant if that had been the case, but we, we know it wasn't at Kirkstall. Um, so that's this wonderful chapter house, which I think really um, is uh, one of the features of the abbey itself. It's so well preserved. Um, this is where the parlour, um, and the parlour, as the name implies, is where they could speak, parlay, parliament. So in this first entrance, um, often the monks would get their jobs for the day in there, um, what they were going to be doing that day. And then the next arch is the staircase that goes up to the dormitory for the choir monks, which was completely separate on the east side of the site. Now, before we go through the gate to the back, I'm just going to show you the north side of um, the uh, north facing side, should I say, of the cloister. That It's called the lavatorium and monks could sit on those seats there. There was running water and this is where they washed um, and they shaved. Um, and monks had these, these tonsures which needed to be, so they had to shave the top of the head and have this tonsure going around, which was supposed to represent the crown of thorns. Um, and um, this is a better picture actually showing all the way along. Um, so there was really a hive of activity in the cloister when there were monks were washing there and others at the other end manu doing manuscripts and going in and out of the parlour. It was a really lively place. You have to try and get that. It wasn't just a dead place of stone. We're now going to go through in the corner of the cloister into the back of some of the other buildings at the back. Um, so um, this is called the Slipe, and they've, this has been rebuilt um, to show what it would have been like, but it would have gone all the way through into the buildings at the back. But you get an idea here. So we're going to go into the infirmary next, um, which um, again, there's not very much stone left here because it was a bit near the road. Um, allegedly, the, the stone um, going down to the river from Leeds Bridge is from stone from the infirmary at um, Kirkstall Abbey. Um, but you can just about see, and, and perhaps in the next picture is a little bit clearer, um, you can see um, where the beds would have gone individually. There would have been arches, there are the, the base of pillars in the middle, so you get some idea of what it would have been like. So this was all kept separate, um, so there was an infirmary here who had his own kitchen, and in here they had a fire, because in the very early days the rest of the abbey was freezing cold, um, apart from a few minutes at the warming room. So this was um, the uh, infirmary and they also got better food here and much earlier they got meat than the rest of the abbey were allowed to have. Um, now in there um, there's a, a little square sort of in the middle of the screen and again one of my um, fellow guides told me that's where the prison was, <laughs> there's a little prison cell in there. Um, but from there you sort of get a good view um, back towards um, some of the other buildings that we're just going to be looking at. Now, of course, with um, the in those days, there weren't any proper medicines, but there were a lot of herbal medicines. And I think this is a nice little feature. They've made some herb gardens here and community groups come along and um, grow herbs. And I think that's a very appropriate place for them to be. Now, the one other thing that I always ask um, visitors about is that as well as sick monks, monks came in here to recover because we know they were bled and that was supposed to um, get rid of, purge them of all sorts of um, nasty things in their blood. Um, and um, it says in one of the guidebooks that they were bled four pints in one go. Um, I don't know if there are any medics out there, but um, I just wonder whether they would survive four pints four times a year. I, I tend to think it should be one pint four times a year, but I, what do I know? <laughs> um, but that does seem rather excessive to some, some poor monks and um, what state they'd be in after that. Right, when we leave the infirmary, um, we, we look back 
towards the abbot's lodging. And again, this is another feature of um, uh, the life of monks. Now, when the abbey was founded in 1152 and under the strict Cistercian rules, um, the uh, abbot was supposed to live with all of the choir monks to share the refectory with them, to share, he'd have his own place in the dormitory. Um, but as early as 1230, um, the abbot then decided actually he was he was getting rather important, he was receiving more visitors and he needed a lodging of his own. So the, the remains of this rather fine building in front of us with the staircase there is the abbot's lodging. So the next thing I do is I take visitors in here and I say to them, what do you think that is in the wall? And there's an identical one above it, about six foot further up, and it's a fireplace. And these were roaring fires in the abbot's lodging, whereas these other poor monks were frozen solid all winter. So things were sort of changing a bit already. Um, although I think at a later stage, some of the monks tried to get um, invitations to the abbot's lodging um, just to get a bit warmer. Um, we come away from the uh, uh, abbot's lodging and this is the site of the original herb garden which was right next to the um, infirmary. I think here that's a rather nice view of the tower of Kirkstall Abbey and I often say to visitors it is sooty, it is dark, but it shouldn't be cleaned because that's part of the history um, of Leeds, the Industrial Revolution and of course it, everything got rather sooty by then. Right, we go through now, move, moving on into um, the dormitory undercroft, as the name implies, this was underneath the dormitory on the first floor for the choir monks. And um, we're not sure exactly what this was used for. We think it was used to instruct novices. Um, so when somebody wanted to become a choir monk, they had a two year induction, if you like, or um, instruction. Um, and I also think probably that those monks in the winter um, at the scriptorium might get a bit numb and not be able to manage to do anything and would come in and get a bit warmer inside but um, that's a bit of speculation really. Um, the place that these monks freezing in Yorkshire winters would have dreamt about was the warming room or the calefactory and you can see there in front of you uh, where there was a big hearth and the monks were allowed 15 minutes a day that's all to warm themselves there um, and um, uh, they weren't allowed to overstay or that would have been a sin so very harsh regime at the time. Then we go into the choir monks refectory. Now this moved round, it was on an east-west axis, but like many of the um, Cistercian abbeys, it became on a north-south axis. Um, and pretty much like any other um, refectory that you would expect to see. But at a later stage, when the rules were relaxed a bit more after 100 or 200 years, they started being allowed meat on certain days. So a new factory, uh, sorry, a new kitchen was um, put at the end on the ground floor. That was the meat kitchen and a, a new floor was added on the first floor. Um, and this is where the vegetables were cooked and the vegetarian bits. So they kept them both separate. Um, but this is where the monks got a bit inventive. Um, when it was on the ground floor, um, then um, they, they were allowed to um, eat there and it was called the misericord, which you've probably heard of in terms of um, what in choirs, um, the choir seats, but it really means mercy. So it was a mercy that they were allowed to have some meat there. But that wasn't enough for the monks as time went on. It got a bit more corrupt, quite frankly, in the 1400s. And the monks read the instruction, the rule of St. Benedict, that you weren't allowed to eat meat, except on special occasions, out uh, inside the refectory. So they ate extra outside the refectory. And we've even got a, a record of one of the monks being told off for taking some meat up to his um, room, his sleeping quarters. But so, so things, it did ease off a bit. So just a little bit, we're nearly there before I get to the end. Um, this is showing you a bit of the tiling floor um, from the um, 
choir monks refectory and I particularly like this one I just picked that one out you can see how fine originally some of this tiling was um, in the refectory the monks ate in silence again um, and one monk was um, in the pulpit in the corner reading from the bible while the others ate in silence um, so we come back through now. You can have a look back through this window, big window in the refectory, and you can see back to where we started off, and that's the vat there for the ale. And we're going back now into um, the cloister. And while we're in this cloister, just at the end, I'm just going to give you a very brief um, rundown of what happened um, at the um, end when the um, when the Henry VIII took his men round to uh, dissolve the, what's the word I was thinking of, dissolution in 1539. Um, so on the 22nd of November, Abbot John Ripley peacefully surrendered in the chapter house. He wasn't involved in the so-called pilgrimage of grace where the abbots who were met a grisly end. Um, and he was probably given the gatehouse to live in and the monks were pensioned off. Um, the abbey was left in ruins so that the monks could not return and repair it. And for a while, animals grazed in the grounds. Um, an orchard was pl planted in the cloister. Um, there was um, obviously the lead was taken away by the men um, and reused for pipes for houses and musket balls. Um, the first time after dissolution, um, it was awarded to Thomas Cranmer in 1542, but it reverted to the crown when he was burned at the stake by the Catholic monarch Mary Tudor in 1556. So Sir Robert Saville purchased the estate in 1584, remained in his family for 100 years. Then it was sold to the Brudenell family, who are well known in Leeds. There's lots of Brudenell references in Headingley, and they were the Earls of Cardigan. Um, and um, it, they owned it. They didn't do a lot with it, but it became a romantic ruin. And there were uh, well-known artists like Turner and Cotman and Gertin who painted it. And there are pictures of um, cows um, in the chapter house and places like that. Um, eventually, um, the lessees who looked after it um, did their best to maintain the Abbey buildings. But when the last one, Butler, died, um, the Leeds Corporation tried to raise the funds to buy it. They wanted to buy it for the city. It was put up for auction in 1883 um, to pay off the debts of the seventh Earl and to pay for essential re repairs. But the money couldn't be found. Um, very fortunately, in 1889, Colonel North um, came, was visiting his home in Kirkstall. He grew up in Leeds, but he made his money in Chile in nitrates and he became very wealthy. And he remembered Kirk's Labby with great affection from when he was a boy playing there. And when he found out it was for sale, he bought the Abbey for £10,000 and the next day he handed it over to Leeds Corporation. He was given the first ever freedom of the borough for his outstanding generosity um, and extensive repairs were done at that time and a major restoration. And the most important legacy, I think, of Colonel North is that he decreed that it should belong to the people of Leeds and you shouldn't be charged to go in. And that is still the case today. So if any of you come um, to Leeds from all over the place and you want to visit Kirk's Labby, you will not have to pay to go in. And I hope you'll remember some of the bits that I've told you today. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. That was um, a fascinating tour. Um, and I'm sure it's whetted a lot of people's appetite to visit and have a guided tour once lockdown conditions allow. Thank you. So, and I must apologise to everybody about the troll that we had on the chat. It, I've never actually um, hosted a Zoom event before and Civic Trust haven't actually had a troll invade the space before. So apologies for that. So I've got a number of questions, Jane. Right, all, do my best. <laughs> um, two, the first two questions are to do with the building. Yeah. So this is from Diane Hilton. The north door, to yeah. do with the north door, when was the porch above put up and later removed? 
over the north door, um, the, the actual surround, the Norman surround was built at the time. Um, but he, she, does she know that there was a canopy over the top of it then? I suspect that was probably there later um, as the abbey expanded and um, became wealthier, but it probably was removed at the dissolution. Mm -hmm. Right, and another question on the building from Jane, James Lyon Joyce. Was the tower square in cross section? On the reconstruction, it looks rectangular. It does look rectangular there, doesn't it? But no, it was square. It was square to begin with. Um, yeah, and it follow, I think it followed a pattern of others as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. A question about the monks from Caroline Kaiser. Was it possible to move up from being a lay monk to being a choir monk? They were, they were entirely separate, the choir monks and the, the lay brothers. Um, I think if, if somebody wanted to become a lay brother, I mean, they, they had a problem in that most of them were illiterate anyway. But I suppose possibly um, if somebody really felt the, the calling, they would have to go under two years of instruction like any of the others. Um, and I suppose they could do. I, I, I've never heard of it happening, but it might happen. From, another, from Diane Hilton, was a califactory usual or califactory usual in the north of England? Yes, it was. Um, in fact, there's a much better one at Fountains Abbey, which has got two great fireplaces there. Um, I think they were needed. I mean, it must have been so cold in the early days. <laughs> um, and from Garance, she says, thank you for a fascinating tour. Do you have a sense of where they recruited their laymen labourers from? Did they need certain skills or do you think the monks were acting as teachers of various craft and labouring skills? That's an interesting question actually. I mean I think they probably, it was a very good life for a labourer because they had a roof over their heads, clothes and food to eat. Um, so I suspect it was very popular actually. I think a lot of people, well of course we, we must remember that some of the lay brothers went out to the farms anyway and were farming um, and there were less later on actually in the abbey itself. Um, but uh, I don't think they went on an active recruitment. I think word probably just got round in those days and, um, you know, they, they could come along and learn some skills, I suppose, the younger ones, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda Kitching, she says, thank you, beautifully put together and explained and what, what a gem Leeds has in Kirkstall Abbey of national importance, but not, not appreciated enough. No brown tourist signs for it anywhere in Leeds. Don't know if you've noticed that. Gosh, no. Or on any motorway road leading to it. Apparently there has been no money for signs for several years. I think we'll have to do something about that. Um, <laughs> I've got two very good fellow guides that come round and during this year in the pandemic we've been doing lots of things. I think we'll start a campaign on that. Yes. That's a great idea. <laughs> yes, I want to keep it a secret. Just, just <laughs> people in the know so they can find the way there. So, um, I don't think you've got any more questions. Oh, yes, I've got another question from Rhiannon Ashton. How many monks and lay brothers were accommodated at the golden age of the Abbey? And would the Abbey have retained important books actually at the Abbey? And she also thinks it was a very in informative talk. Yeah. Pleased you have chosen this subject. And she says that we do to us of Cistercian Magum Abbey in Wales. Oh, right. Yeah, it, that's the fascinating thing. I remember when I hadn't been doing it very long, I went to Wally Abbey, um, which is in, La I think it's in Lancashire or sort of on the border north. And I thought, this looks just like Kirkstall. And then I realised that all these Cistercian abbeys are exactly the same plan. It's amazing, really. Um, to go back to the numbers, um, certainly we know there are about 75 um, lay brothers uh, in Kirk's Abbey at the beginning um, and probably another 75 out in the um, Granges, probably about the same number on, of, of choir monks. I'm not an expert on that so I'm just sort of um, not exactly guessing but ascertaining that probably was about the level. Of course um, a tragedy like everywhere else when there was the Black Death um, it devastated the um, community there and there were probably about 14 monks left for a while so it was just dreadful. Mm -hmm. 
Um, right, now, remember you talked about the blood letting. <laughs> oh yes, has anybody come up with that? <laughs> well, I don't know if this is, uh, Mary Roberts says you have eight pints of blood. Does yeah. that mean there's eight pints of blood in the human body? I don't know. I didn't do anatomy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Is it eight or is it nine? <laughs> but uh, it sounded horrendous. <laughs> I did read somewhere else that they stopped when they lost consciousness. So <laughs> maybe it was that point. But I think if somebody lost four pints of blood today, they'd be rushed into hospital and be put on a blood transfusion. <laughs> Um, just look and see if there's any more questions. A lot of thanks. Uh, oh, that's nice. Somebody said, uh, Julian Murray said, were choir monks priests? Oh, Joyce Hill says there are eight pints. Sorry, um, were any of the choir monks? Well, they were priests, yes. Once they'd done their, their sort of two years induction or whatever, yes, they were priests. And at the dissolution, some of them came along to be, uh, went, went to be vicars and priests in local churches. Mm -hmm. Um, right, John Harris says there was a legend of a ghost, the blue lady. Have you seen her? I think that's a sort of tourist thing. <laughs> if people want to think there's a ghost there, they can go in the dark on a dark night and imagine it. <laughs> and are the records of the Abbey available in the Leeds Museum or Yorkshire Archives? That's a question from Carol Holloway. I'm not very well qualified to see that. One of my um, fellow guides, Lorraine, has been doing some um, research in the, well, actually partly to do with monks' diets in the Central Library. Um, I, did, I did wonder where some of these beautiful documents got to after the dissolution. And I am told that some of them are in the Bodleian Library. I think some got rescued, um, whereas, you know, in a lot of the abbeys, they all got destroyed. Mm -hmm. Right, I'll just take a final couple of questions from Jocelyn Brooks. Is it true Hello, that Alton Grange was a granary for Kirkstall Abbey? It's a distance away from the Abbey. I think, it I think it probably was um, because, you know, all of that, the, the, the mill there the, for grain and um, Kirk, I haven't had time to mention Kirkstall Forge, really, which allegedly was, well, it was started by the monks. So I would think so, you know, because it was a, a very big area. I mean, when you look at the extent of the granges, um, you know, people, I won't read them all out, but people would recognise the names from round Leeds, you know, Adel Allerton, Gledhow, Armley, Bar etc. So I would think that's probably the case. Oh, here's Lorraine. Some books were rescued and a few are still extant. That's one of my fellow um, guides. <laughs> Michael Cowling says, the prison you mentioned, who would go there and why? <laughs> and it was <laughs> Susan that who <laughs> told me what it was. They must have done something naughty. I shouldn't think they stayed there for very, maybe they were drunk and <laughs> had to be sobered up or so. I don't know, that's speculation. Um, they, they couldn't have lived in there for very long because it's just a small square cell, literally. Mm -hmm. um, Janet says, can you say anything about Hark to Rover? You know Hark to Rover, which is... It's quite interesting because there's a inside the Abbey House Museum, there's a Hark to Rover, if I remember rightly, there's a Hark to Rover pub in there, which is mocked up from what one would have looked like. So I think that was the original pub at the top where um, I suspect some of those older cottages have got stone in them from Kirkstall Abbey. And I think I'll just finish on, on this one. Um, Carol said, I visited an abbey in Normandy that said it was the sister abbey of Kirkstall. Really? Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it could easily be. I mean, it might be wider as well. Yeah, that's very interesting. I hadn't heard that. Mm -hmm. Right, so it, it's now just after eight, so we'll end there. But as I say, there's a lot of people who've really enjoyed the presenta presentation. And I certainly enjoyed hearing all about Kirkstall Abbey, and I'm definitely going to join a tour as soon as we can. So, I'm sorry about that little glitch at the beginning, but <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jane, and thank you for everybody who's attended tonight.